Good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the, the third day of this conference. Um, my name is Robert Thomas of the School of Law, University of Manchester. I'd like to, to welcome you um, here this morning and also to welcome our speakers. There's been um, much discussion throughout this conference about administrative law and in particular judicial review and in particular discussion about the, the doctrinal and theoretical aspects of judicial review and that provides real insights, much needed insight into how judicial review operates. We also need a, a variety of different methodologies to understand public law as there's no single method that by itself can shed light on the entirety of the subject. And one crucial issue concerning judicial review is, well, what impact or effect does it actually have on government? What difference does judicial review have on political and governmental behaviour? It's therefore essential to have detailed and informed studies of judicial review in practice. And it's also important to have empirical data and empirical research into the role and impact of judicial review on government. We are therefore very fortunate today, this morning, to have two papers by three highly distinguished speakers who have closely studied the operation of judicial review in practice. The names of Harlow and Rawlings are something of an institution in administrative law. And together, Carol and Rick oh, have, have produced <laughs> the, 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 Produced a, uh, together they've produced a classic text, Law and Administration, in addition to Pressure Through Law, and they also have a forthcoming book, Process and Procedure in European Union Administration. Carol is Emerita Professor at LSE, and Rick is Professor of Public Law at UCL, and they'll be delivering the first paper. We also have Maurice Sunkin, who's Professor of Public Law and Socio-Legal Studies at the University of Essex. And Morris has spent years, I think, studying, undertaking empirical research into the operation of judicial review, the dynamics of judicial review litigation, and also whether or not judicial review improves the quality of public services. So I'd ask you to, to welcome our speakers this morning. Well, I was going to say good morning. Um, I think I'm going to say well done, guys, because uh, nine o'clock after a conference dinner and parking your luggage, etc., is a remarkable achievement. Okay, um, we're talking about striking back and clamping down, and the title changed um, from the one originally advertised for a reason I'll explain. Now, what we mean by striking back is the idea of deliberately negative official responses to court rulings. And we think that this is something which is all too often glossed over in the literature on judicial review. Clearly, as Rob suggested, it feeds into discussions of impact, and it's also uh, an intrinsic part of the burgeoning law and democracy debate um, which is uh, so familiar uh, in this jurisdiction today and so many others. And um, by presenting this paper to the conference, we're uh, trying to redress the balance a little. And uh, striking back, we want to emphasize, is hardly new, uh, nor is it confined to the Westminster model of parliamentary government, um, though I think we can all see that uh, the opportunities uh, for striking back under the Westminster model of parliamentary government may be particularly strong. Now, this is a topic that um, Carol and I have long been interested in um, as part of our general functionalist take on the role and contribution of law in politics and in the administrative process in particular. And to Carol goes the honour of, I think, the first paper in the UK on this subject in 1976, where typically she was warning against the complacent view that when 
the courts barked, if indeed they ever did in those days, uh, administrators and politicians jumped. And she in turn was drawing on some work that she'd done in France and the work of great uh, French administrative law lawyer Guy Brébon, uh, who had uh, looked at the phenomenon of striking back and had uh, identified a number of possible techniques, uh, delay, uh, retaking a decision that's already been quashed in the same way, and of course, validatory legislation. And in typically blunt uh, language, Carroll added, quote, simply disobey, unquote. And uh, this topic has, has um, really been a, a, a lead motif, I think, of successive editions of our book, uh, Lord Administration. And we've been particularly interested in the way the changing opportunity structures, if you like, uh, for government to respond to judicial review in this way in a changing political and constitutional context. And of course, when, we, um, when Carroll was first writing about this in 1976, uh, essentially she was uh, looking at this in the context of a strong doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty. And over the years, um, we've uh, naturally factored in uh, the uh, growing influence of the European Convention on Human Rights, latterly the Human Rights Act, and of course uh, the European communities, now the European Union, uh, starting just before Carroll was writing in 1976. But a key point we want to stress today is that despite these overarching constitutional changes, we see a large element of continuity in the practices of striking back. Uh, we think that the objectives are often the same. Many of the tactics, uh, though not all the targets, uh, remain the same. Now that's what I wanted to say about the nature and the history of the inquiry. Second uh, aspect I'd like to introduce this morning is this idea of clamping down. And this is something that we spun out of the paper as we uh, worked on it. Because thinking further about the general theme of the conference, uh, the idea of the interplay of substance and process, we thought it was uh, particularly interesting to um, emphasize the way in which uh, government through the legislature may seek to change the rules of the judicial review game. In other words, not talking here about particular responses to particular cases, but particular attempts to in some way uh, limit, suppress, even perhaps obliterate the activity of judicial review in certain areas of administration. There's a further twist. Um, Rob very kindly mentioned our book, Pressure Through Law, which was one of the first attempts back in 1992 to uh, consider the role of uh, interest group litigation and litigation strategies in this jurisdiction, a, uh, an aspect of uh, uh, law and politics, which of course is very familiar uh, in the United States, for example. And uh, back in 1992, uh, we noted that uh, striking back uh, and, well, sorry, clamping down may be directed more at interest groups and less at the courts. Of course, you can't, you can't disentangle the two, but the essential target of government may be uh, interest groups and interest group litigation. And against the background of what, even before the Human Rights Act, was clearly a growth area of this activity, uh, we hypothesized that one day government might, might seek to clamp down on this form of activity. We mentioned the possibility of ouster or privative clauses. We noted the possibility of recasting judicial review procedures for example, more restrictive rules on standing to sue, and of course, limitations on funding. 
looking back on that sort of 20 years later, perhaps we were more prescient than we would have wished to be. Pressure through law also opened up uh, another set of activities um, uh, to view, which was the idea of interest group activity, uh, not just inside the domestic system, but looking internationally at the arenas in uh, Luxembourg and in Strasbourg. And that's the, those are the aspects that Carol will be focusing on in her half of our talk. Present purposes, that opens up another possibility in terms of clamping down, which is legislating against international legal obligations. And many of you will understand the contemporary link uh, that uh, we have in mind there. In part one of the paper, uh, we then uh, look at the way in which striking back and clamping down can play out uh, in the uh, what we call Westminster at home situation. In other words, where the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty is essentially uh, in play. And we document uh, the historical development, first by looking at some very famous illustrations, Panfield, Burma Oil, Anna's Minnick, essentially by asking the question, yes, but what happened next? And then drawing on Tony Prosser's uh, excellent work, uh, pioneering work on litigation strategy by the Child Poverty Action Group, we look at some of the more ground level uh, responses, in particular less well-known cases uh, that uh, government and parliament have developed over the years. I was interested yesterday to uh, hear about Australia and the way in which it was argued that attempts to limit judicial activity in Australia had perhaps had the perverse effect of actually strengthening judicial activity. Um, but this phenomenon can work the other way around too. Um, one of the developments that many colleagues will be familiar with in the 1990s in this jurisdiction is the way in which the courts, through a number of uh, creative cases, Witham, for example, was mentioned by Lord Justice Laws, uh, acted to uh, curb and control the use of lawmaking by regulation. One response to that that we've identified is the idea of fast-track legislation, the use, on the one hand, of parliamentary sovereignty, uh, to immunise uh, reacting legislation, but on the other hand, the use of very attenuated procedures to pass that primary legislation. And that in turn raises normative concerns that uh, run through this paper. Um, we would not argue that uh, striking back responses are per se a bad thing. Government must govern, uh, we all know about the limitations of the judicial review process, and of course government has a particular concern about the interests of the taxpayer. But we would emphasise the importance of procedural legitimacy, and picking up on some criteria that Tony introduced all those years ago, uh, we would look for public responses, for informed debate, um, about um, the policy that um, government is bringing forward when it is reacting to judicial review, and of course picking up on what Jerry Mashall was saying, reasoned justification. And it has to be said, and Carol will develop this theme further, uh, that there are um, a disturbing number of illustrations uh, where those criteria do not seem to be met. And then finally, and very briefly, um, to give Carol adequate time, um, I draw attention to what we've said about ideas of clamping down. And essentially, uh, we see uh, two major attempts at clamping down. First, what I called uh, the revenge package back in 2004, when uh, the Labour government uh, fed up with uh, strong judicial or large numbers of judicial reviews, rather, in the area of asylum and immigration, 
attempted a wide-ranging and um, uh, strong attack on judicial review activity in that area, centred on a, uh, a strong ouster or privative clause. And uh, we uh, recall the way in which Parliament acted in defence of judicial review on that occasion, in particular the House of Lords, and one also uh, can't help feeling that the case of Jackson, where um, the uh, certain members of the House of Lords suggested that one day the rule of law might trump parliamentary sovereignty, well, I don't think it's a coincidence uh, that Jackson was handed down just uh, very soon after uh, that uh, big political struggle in Parliament. And then second, uh, we have a second attempt at clamping down, uh, going on as we speak. It's less blunt. Uh, it involves a, a, a number of moves uh, by government uh, centred on a bill currently uh, before Parliament. And it is aimed in particular, as we'd suggested all those years ago in Pressure Through Law, at interest groups. So there are some very interesting clauses attempting to impose uh, financial disincentives, in particular on interest groups uh, in relation to interventions, uh, test case litigation, etc. Uh, we wait to see whether that legislation passes. Um, it's got a long way, but then again, events in Scotland uh, may uh, so squeeze the remaining legislative um, uh, programme of the government in the next few months uh, that uh, it may be that this bill uh, is put to one side. Uh, we will see. Thank you. Our purpose in the second stage <coughs> of this exploration was to look critically at the idea that the Constitution had inexorably changed, which is uh, an idea commonly promulgated and indeed about which Danny Nicholl has written rather a good book. Uh, to summarise, the once sovereign parliament has been dethroned, making it difficult to trump the judges by the devices which Rick has been talking about, such as ouster clauses and retrospective legislation, both of which we noted was extremely, were extremely suspect under European law. Uh, and before moving on, I realise that there are a lot of people in this room that are not obsessed with European affairs, and I just want to make two short points for them. First of all, bear in mind that the jurisprudence of the Luxembourg Court of Justice is binding on uh, British courts, while they simply must take account of the jurisprudence of the Court of Human Rights. That's pretty well known, but I'm reminding you. And secondly, that EU legislation takes two forms. Regulations, which are directly applicable in the member states, and directives which have to be implemented. And they are implemented in the UK either by statute, but in um, the majority of cases uh, through delegated legislation, orders and council. And uh, so th that occurs in one of the cases that we looked at. I would also uh, like to make a, a, a much less practical point. Both of these transnational courts function inside political systems where it is very difficult to strike back at the courts um, directly because the political <coughs> leaders are so hard to shift. And in the EU, there is, to my knowledge, only one uh, publicised example. There are probably other examples, but as they occur in the notably untransparent procedures of the Council and the, um, the negotiations there, we don't know about them. But after the Factor Tame and Frankovich litigation, in which the Court of Justice suddenly discovered that the treaties um, placed an obligation on member states 
to um, uh, make good losses suffered by uh, violations of EU law. The UK did try to get those decisions re reversed and um, they used an uh, intergovernmental conference to su suggest treaty uh, changes in order to deal with the position. And I think it goes almost without saying that the attempt was entirely unsuccessful. <coughs> so in our paper, we've referred to a number of cases, and even that's quite a short selection of the cases which actually exist. And even um, about those, I haven't very much time left to um, describe them, do more than describe them. But we chose to refer to the very recent case of data protection and the data protection and investigatory powers bill that the government introduced in the aftermath of a court of justice ruling that the EU data protection directive was invalid. Now this left the government with a technical problem because it was relying as its power base on um, regulations which had been introduced to implement a directive which was subsequently thought to be, said to be invalid. And um, uh, at the time when the bill was introduced, we are told that there was a challenge expected in the divisional court by means of judicial <coughs> review. So this may be one motive why they suddenly decided to legislate and introduce a bill by fast-track legislation. Certainly in the House, that motive was questioned. But the um, point we really want to make about the bill was something which occurred during the debate when a leading Eurosceptic uh, asserted to Theresa May, the Home Secretary, that the real um, target, no, it wasn't, sorry, it was a, um, a, another Minister of State, that the real target was the European courts, that they were trying to strike back <coughs> at the European courts. He actually said European courts, and he talked mostly about Strasbourg, uh, Luxembourg, but he mentioned Strasbourg. And he said in the debate that only a Canadian-style notwithstanding clause would do the job for Parliament in this type of situation. Funnily enough, the government didn't respond to that. We discovered, however, that that sort of bleak prospect for the U UK Parliament wasn't entirely true. And uh, we noted uh, the occurrence of, uh, during debates on the recent immigration bill. These introduced new and new and old, in a way, techniques of structuring judicial discretion. And one section in the Act, as it became the Immigration Act 2014, is particularly fierce because it seems to instruct the judiciary not only on the definition of various terms, which is an obvious new technique which Parliament may use to tell the judiciary how they must define certain things, and again, there's resonance there with Australia, but actually says um, in a further section what weight the judges are to, be, are to give to the criteria that they have to take into account. So in a sense, they're saying, no European-style proportionality. We are telling you what proportionality means in this particular case. And once again, we await the outcome and response of the judiciary. The second thing we discovered was, what, well, we've known this for a long time, was that the various supranational arrangements and processes of multi-level decision-making afford new opportunities. And the spray balance category of delay and the skillful use of jurisdictional technicalities that can help the government here. In the case of the EU, we have um, cited the, the um, affair of the UN target sanctions, targeted sanctions by means of asset freezing, which are so well known around the world that I scarcely have to go further into it. But uh, there are two particularly important 
cases in Europe. The first is the case of Cardi, which is um, celebrated for the judgment of the um, Court of Justice. But Cardi, as a suspect, underwent 12 years of fruitless and extremely expensive litigation, with the end result being no outcome. There was no, um, despite all the things that the court said, there was no favourable outcome and he was not delisted. And it was left to a UN ombudsman to secure his delisting. In the second case, the case of the Mohardeen, um, they litigated for around a decade um, in which the member states played um, cat and mouse games by getting them listed at level, the bottom level and the middle level and the top level and using all the jurisdictional problems to um, prevent them getting off the list. And in both cases, member states um, uh, uh, you know, played uh, what you might call uh, striking back games using the levels very skillfully. In the case of the uh, Court of Human Rights, there is the well-known um, Hearst case where the Court of Human Rights ruled that a British statute which imposed a blanket ban on prisoners from voting was a violation of the Convention. And the Court itself struck at the UK Parliament by saying that Parliament had never considered the matter, although it had had some 60 years so to do. And Parliament, Parliament itself, and not the government, struck back at the Court of Human Rights by moving a resolution that the UK law was in all ways entirely satisfactory. In the interim, the government had prepared draft legislation and it conducted impeccably impact assessments, consultations, reconsultations, and so on and so forth, until it um, finally <coughs> put in place a draft bill in the year 2012, which was six years or so after the decision. And alongside, it was actually uh, defending further cases in Strasbourg, which is a, a, a good way, really, of uh, striking back, and intervening in a case brought against Italy to argue that Strasbourg ought to reconsider its original decision, which Strasbourg refused to do on the grounds of legal certainty. And uh, finally, uh, again, Hearst was decided, as I said, in 2006, and so far, it has never been implemented. And you can see that if any uh, steps were taken, they were taken, uh, I think, by the Strasbourg court in softening its jurisprudence to accommodate uh, the United Kingdom. From that, I think we uh, deduced that uh, Parliament will do better if it can get the domestic courts on its side. Uh, I have only time to draw conclusions. There is one case um, in the paper that you might like to look at. It is of an incredible complexity, and I regret to tell you that the footnotes are entirely wrong. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, that is a case uh, uh, which I think is quite uncomfortable because uh, Rick and I argue that it actually threatens the whole idea of Westminster governance by suggesting that retrospective legislation or legislation uh, to outlaw litigation in which the government itself is um, implemented may be contrary to the human convention as implemented in the Con uh, Human Rights Act. But I will uh, leave that there as it's only a first instance decision so far and uh, summarise what we think we have learned. We first, as Rick has already said, noted that striking back and clamping down has multiple targets. And the government has, the present government, has struck back at public interest litigation um, because I think it shifts decision making into uh, courts and involves um, uh, 
the transnational courts. It has struck back at UK judges and um, also at their expansionist movement to, uh, to increase the ambit of judicial review. And it has struck back at the Human Rights Convention and the Human Rights Act and, uh, uh, and at Strasbourg, which actually implements or acts as the implementing um, force for the Convention. As Rick said also, we have concerns about the legitimacy of some of the traditional practices which uh, don't, in our view, measure up to the sort of good governance criteria and principles that, by and large, modern governments have tried to observe. We are quite impressed, however, with the degree of continuity uh, and the, the way in which uh, traditional techniques are still in operation. We've noted that some new opportunities have actually been created, perhaps to fill spaces that have uh, uh, been left by uh, the uh, introduction of European law. Uh, and our conclusion is that Parliament at least believes that it is still sovereign. And uh, now we turn over to, to Maurice Sunkin and his paper. Thank you. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and particularly a pleasure to follow uh, Rick and Carol's uh, uh, excellent uh, paper and presentation. Uh, the themes in my uh, paper are um, similar and very compatible with uh, the previous paper, insofar as I'm going to be addressing um, the, the process of clamping down, I think one would uh, put it as, as Rick and uh, uh, Carol explain, and the, uh, the basis on which clamping down is occurring, um, and in particular the, uh, uh, the evidence base for this, uh, this clamping down. Um, unlike most of the papers in this conference, I'm not going to be talking very much about the law. Um, much of what I'm going to be saying is about the effect and implications, or possible effect and implications of, 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 of reforms and change. Um, but before I start, I, I ought to acknowledge um, with thanks the, uh, uh, the help uh, and involvement of, of, of my colleague Govada Bondi, who unfortunately can't be with us today. Much of the work that I'm going to be talking about um, this morning has been undertaken with Varda in her capacity as research director of the Public Law Project. Um, and um, I'll be talking a bit later in the, uh, in the paper refers to various uh, uh, reports that we've co-authored. Now as an overview, this uh, presentation uh, and discussion it, it is conducted against the background of the current reforms that um, uh, Rick and Carol has re referred to. Um, and as, as you know, uh, there's quite a rich body of empirically based research on the effects and impacts of judicial review. But little, um, if any, use uh, was made of that research um, by the government in preparing and presenting its reforms. And the government was much <coughs> criticised for failing to take uh, uh, adequate account of the empirical research on judicial review. And the government was criticised both uh, in Parliament through the Joint Committee on Human Rights and also uh, in proceedings before the House of Lords uh, Constitution Committee. Given that the primary purpose of the government's proposals were to clamp down on the use of judicial review, curtail the use of judicial review. There's one particular exchange in the House of Lords um, that um, I think is quite striking, and um, I refer to it in the, in the paper, but it's a, a series of questions that were put to uh, Chris Grayling, MP, of course, Minister of Justice and Lord Chancellor, um, where he was asked about the evidence base for the government uh, reforms and their implications. 
And one particular exchange I think summarises the position quite neatly. Lord Hart of Chiltern said, by what proportion do you think that your proposals are going to lead to a decline in the number of judicial reviews? And Mr Chris Grading MP replied, I do not know the answer to that. Um, now, a striking instance of uh, ministerial honesty. Um, and even with a, a huge body of empirical research at his fingertips, he may not have been able to answer that question. But given that the main thrust of the reforms was to curtail and reduce the use of judicial review, one would have expected um, a little bit more insight into the likely implications of the reforms on the way judicial review is to be used. Anyway, in the, in the paper I start by saying that Actually, rather ironically, had the government looked closely at the empirical research um, on how judicial review is used and its impact, they might have found, in fact, that um, curtailing the use of judicial review is unlikely to have any great effect, given that much of the empirical research on judicial review seems to suggest that the instrumental effects of judicial review are relatively minimal. And we've had the paper from Rick and Carol looking at the... Um, impacts of judicial review on broader constitutional change, um, but also the research on the impacts of judicial review on public administration, the quality of public administration, seems to indicate um, that uh, judicial review has little direct instrumental effect on public administration. Um, and there's been very little research, actually, on the impact and effects of judicial review on uh, providing redress for particular claimants. So they may well have found, had they looked at the research closely, that there was much to support their view that curtailing the use of judicial review would have benefits but relatively few costs in terms of its instrumental effect. Um, however, my paper um, seeks to present um, a rather more positive, if you like, less self-effacing um, view of judicial review's impact, uh, particularly on public administration and the provision of redress. Um, and that uh, it, it may well be that containing uh, the use of judicial review will have rather more severe adverse implications than the government seems to, seems to uh, assume, um, not only on the use of judicial review by pressure groups, um, but also more broadly, indeed, on the quality of public administration. Um, as, as you know, the research on the impact of judicial review broadly covers um, three uh, areas. Uh, its impacts on social and policy change, uh, its impacts on public administration, and the, thirdly, uh, its impacts on redress. Um, I'm not going to say anything more about one. Um, Carol and, and Rick have addressed that, and it's uh, an issue that is beyond the scope of my particular presentation. But I want to focus a little bit more specifically on JR's impacts on public administration and the provision of uh, redress. The prevailing message, as I say, in relation to judicial review's inf influence on public administration is that um, the courts exert or appear to exert relatively little influence on public administration. And Geneva Richardson, when she reviewed the research that's been undertaken, particularly in England uh, and Wales on this area, said um, it seems to show that there's nothing particularly significant about judicial review in relation to um, the way the public administration operates. And uh, the research findings illustrate, she said, the relatively low priority which can be given to juridi juridical norms in the context of bureaucratic decision making. And indeed, um, she highlighted that uh, where judicial review does exert influence, much of the research seems to indicate that, that, that the impacts of judicial review appear to be negative or defensive, um, and particularly drawing there upon the work of Simon Halliday and Ian Loveland on homelessness decision making, mass decision making in the context of a particular area of public administration, homelessness uh, decisions. And there um, the researchers showed just how um, public administrators tend to use their experience of judicial review to develop defensive strategies to protect themselves against future challenges. 
um, and to develop um, um, really a, a various insulating, insulating techniques, which uh, the researchers regard as negative insofar as they didn't, um, um, didn't promote the, the virtues or the values of, of judicial review. However, there is a, a rosier picture, um, and it's a rosier picture that I'd like to, to present. And I can, I can start really with uh, the work that Jeff King's uh, done um, in the context of um, social, um, economic and social rights, where he uh, makes uh, five, five points about the uh, existing research on the impact of judicial review and public administration. First of all, he says that the work on areas such as homelessness may be unrepresentative of uh, the impact of judicial review in other areas of, of public administration. Secondly, he says that such work takes inadequate note of how practitioners view the impact of the courts. Um, uh, thirdly, he says that the findings in other jurisdictions um, have been much more upbeat, particularly in relation to the effect of judicial review as a mechanism of redress than the uh, research suggests in, in this country. Uh, uh, fourthly, he says that the research undervalues um, the, the use of judicial review as a mechanism of individual redress. And the final point he makes is that the research that's been conducted, much of the research that's been conducted, is primarily qualitative in nature rather than quantitative in nature. Not surprising because much of the research has been undertaken by, by lawyers. And until you get a better quantitative feel for the effect of judicial review and public administration, you have no way of measuring whether or not judicial review is having a marginal effect or, or a, 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 a more central effect. Now, my paper um, develops those points, drawing on three studies that I've been uh, involved in over the last few years. One on the impact of judicial review on the quality of local government services in England and Wales. This project was conducted as part of the ESRC Public Services Programme. It was one of, I think, very few legally orientated uh, research projects in that, uh, that programme. The second was a, a project that I conducted uh, with the Public Law Project, funded by Nuffield on the dynamics of JR litigation. And the third project is a more recent project on the effects and value of judicial review. It's also conducted by um, Essex with the Public Law Project and funded by, by Nuffield. Um, and that project is currently being um, written up. And I'm going to be presenting, uh, the paper presents some findings from, from that work. First, um, then, the ESRC study. This uh, adopted both qualitative and quantitative methods. And the qualitative methods included a series of case studies. And these case studies were based on uh, decisions that public administrators in local authorities had told us were important. And we, we, we went and, uh, and asked local authority officers whether there were any cases over the last few years that they regard as particularly significant in terms of impact. And they gave us a list of cases. And interestingly, the list included very few that we had been aware of previously. <laughs> These were cases that mattered to them, but didn't matter to us as, as lawyers. They weren't landmark decisions. Uh, they didn't necessarily reflect key points of law, key changes in legal developments. They weren't necessarily the sort of cases that we, as, uh, uh, as lecturers, would have told our students about um, in terms of their significance. And two in particular I refer to in the paper. One is the... the I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, the Beer case against London uh, Borough of Hillingdon, and the other is the Jay case against Carefilly County uh, Borough Council. I won't go into any detail about these, these cases here. Suffice to say that these cases were very interesting when one looked at the, uh, the, their, their impacts because they affected different aspects of local authority decision making. The Beer case was essentially about resources, the courts told uh, Hillingdon Council that they had certain specific duties to uh, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, and the duties extended to providing a range of services that Hillingdon had claimed need not, to be need not be provided. Of course, the immediate impact of this 
statutory duty to provide an increased range of services was that Hillingdon had certain financial problems to face. It had been doing what it regarded as necessary and possible given its resources and it now had additional duties which had financial consequences imposed upon it. And of course the judgment didn't come with any money, and judgments don't come with money, uh, and Hillingdon had to find a way of coping with the decision, um, either by reassessing its resource priorities so that they shifted it towards providing services to unaccompanied asylum-seeking children with possible adverse political consequences, um, or trying to increase its resource, trying to get more money from somewhere, particularly from central government. Um, and we were told by the officials that this case was a bit of a disaster initially, and it, it, whilst it, it, it provided certainty and clarity for frontline decision makers, it provided real problems for those who were holding the budgets and having to argue within the various financial uh, committees about the relative allocation of resources across departments. Interestingly, the case came to be a, a resource for the local authority in its negotiations with central government for more money. Essentially, the local authority and other local authorities in a similar position said to government, look, we've been forced by the courts to spend more money, we need more money, and the government eventually conceded that um, that was the case and provided additional finances. So, of course, a court, that, a court decision that initially challenged and posed a problem for the uh, authority came to be a resource in terms of its broader financial obligations. The Caffini case was rather different. This case uh, uh, concerned the uh, duties of a local authority to develop care plans for um, uh, children, uh, young adults, who um, were in need. And the specific issue was the extent to which, in developing a care plan, the local authorities had to have regard to the interests of the family and involve the family in the decision making. Um, and Kefili had taken an approach that was informed by their practice and culture, which was heavily criticised by, by the courts. Uh, and that Munby, uh, just, Mr. Justice Munby, as he then was, was highly critical of the practice of local, this local authority and local authorities in general in the way they developed care plans. And he called for a fresh culture. I think somebody uh, said that one doesn't want to have a courts instructing public administrators how to conduct their business. But here was a case where Mr. Justice Munby was very specific. He gave quite clear instructions to local authorities in general as to how care plans should be um, uh, established. Now that case also came as a complete shock to the local authority. It wasn't expecting the challenge. It didn't like the challenge. The social workers didn't like the idea of having, a, if you like, a court telling it what to do. Uh, we were told that the, uh, that the judges didn't understand how difficult it is to um, <coughs> manage uh, this particular area. Uh, what judges didn't, didn't know what it's like to work with a difficult child who didn't cooperate with them, wouldn't turn up for meetings and so on and so forth. Um, and um, it would re regard, it was initially regarded as a judgment that forced social services to, to adopt juridical, what you might call ju ju juridical standards ju uh, in, 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 in a context where, where they've not been previously regarded as necessary or possible. However, in the fullness of time, the local authority uh, did redress, so did, 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 did reassess its practice, um, and it did change its procedures, and it did become more, as it were, legal in, in the way it approached this particular field of decision making, and it became a model in the area, and it, there was conferences held in Wales and, and elsewhere, where Caerphilly became the model model local authority in this field and later on the, the, the officials said well um, yes we didn't like the case when it first arrived on our doorsteps but actually it was a really good decision and it's improved the quality of what we're doing and we're very pleased we went through that awful experience. Now I don't know when we were interviewing these people whether somebody had a, a gun to their head or whether they thought well we'd better say nice things about lawyers um, but that's what we were told and um, it suggested that um, this idea that the judgments are always negative and also always inconvenient and don't have positive effects on, on public administration is, is, at worst, uh, is at worst a complete caricature uh, and at best um, un, 
that does not reflect the actual subtleties of the, of the, of the situation. Anyway, we, the, the other aspect of this research is also uh, quite interesting, the, the quantitative uh, aspect of the research. And I, I should say that I was not leading on the quantitative aspects of the um, project. Uh, my colleague uh, Lucinda Platt, who is now Professor of Social Policy at the LSE, was the leader in this aspect of the research. And we were concerned with two issues, really, with the main issues, the effect of judicial review on the quality of local authorities. Of course, what is quality? How do you assess quality? We used the um, comprehensive performance assessment scores. This is a, a range of scores that are used by government, work at the time used by government to assess the quality of local authority performance. And these scores were used for funding purposes. Um, and these are comprehensive performance assessments. They're looking overall at the quality of local authorities' um, service provision. Um, they're not ideal, um, they're very rough and ready, there's a lot of criticism of them, but they were one measure of quality that we could use um, that we thought might help us. They don't reflect, they don't reflect compliance with legal standards or juridical norms uh, or values of judicial review, so we can't tell whether um, high quality in terms of uh, CPA means uh, high quality in terms of legal compliance. However, in asking two questions, do poorly performing authorities attract higher levels of judicial review than better performing authorities? We thought we'd get some sense of whether there are links between quality and judicial challenge. And the second question was, do legal challenges lead to improvements in the quality of services? Of course, the most interesting question from, from our point of view. The answer to the first question, do poorly performing authorities attract more challenges? The answer is yes. Yes, but, and there's uh, some qualification of this, and it's discussed in the paper. Second question, which I, I want to spend a little bit of time on, do legal challenges lead to improvements in the quality of services? Our hypothesis actually was the, the, the more an authority is challenged, the lower the quality of its services should be. I mean, that seemed to be the logic of what everybody was saying, that judicial review challenges absorb resources from core areas of service provision and focus resources that are needed elsewhere on particular problems, with a, 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 a resulting decline in the quality of what the local authority is doing. In fact, we didn't find that at all. We find that there's a statistically reliable association between an increase in the incidence of judicial review from the level authorities uh, have previously experienced and the achievement of higher CPA scores. Now, I've Itilize uh, the increase. It's very important. We're talking about an increase in the, ex in, in the experience of judicial review. So there are broadly three types of local authority in terms of judicial review experience. Those that are highly challenged, those that are very rarely challenged, and most local authorities in England and Wales are very rarely challenged, and very rarely challenged. Perhaps 80% of authorities in England and Wales are challenged no more than two or three times a year. Um, <coughs> with many authorities in that category, and there are obviously authorities in the media. In the <coughs> But in each instance, where the authorities had an increase in the level of challenge against them from that they normally experience, there was an increase in the quality as measured by the CA, C, CPA scores. Now, of course, there's some needs for caution in, in relation to causality. We couldn't establish clearly there's a causal link between those two, 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 two things. Um, and the incidence of challenge in them. The, the increase in the quality of local authority services may be a, a, a spurious connection. It may be caused by other factors. But nonetheless, we felt that the finding is uh, highly suggestive and somewhat unexpected. And in particular, um, it, it, we didn't see any evidence that an increase in challenge had diminished the quality of services. We would have expected to see that. We would have expected to see as, in, as a challenge increased so the quality declined. We didn't find that. We didn't find that JR overall was diverting resources to the detriment of service provision. Now the big question, of course, for us and for you is why? I mean, what is happening here? Why is it that an increase in challenge appears to be leading to uh, improved uh, quality scores? Um, now, we didn't have the answer to that very, 
that it's one that sort of invites, invites speculation and invites more work. In, the, in a paper we wrote, which is in, in the Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory, we came up with various theories about why this might be the case, um, insofar as judicial review may be assisting, it may be enabling reconsideration of service provision, the sort of experience we saw in the Caffini case or in the Beer case, it might be providing guidance, it might be keeping authorities on their toes, I mean all sorts of factors might, might, might be explaining this and uh, it's certainly an area that um, we would um, welcome more work on. The second project, the dynamics of judicial review litigation, isn't concerned, wasn't concerned with the effect of judicial review on public authorities, it was primarily concerned with the effect of judicial review litigation on the parties, how the parties themselves engage with uh, the judicial review procedure. Um, and it threw light on the dynamics of, of litigation, in particular on the process of settlement. And um, very, very briefly, uh, the findings are discussed in a bit more detail in the paper. We found, to give you some statistics, I know you love statistics, we found 34% of the cases we looked at, 1,449 cases, um, were withdrawn prior to the permission stage, prior to, the, as it were, the first stage of the judicial review procedure. And the vast, vast majority of those cases uh, were withdrawn because they were settled in favour of claimants. And there are two particular factors we found that were significant in explaining why settlements were occurring and why they were occurring in favour of claimants. And I should say, although were, when I say in favour of claimants, the substantive outcomes were in favour of the claimants. The fact that the cases were settling was obviously a benefit to the defendant public authorities as well, and to the courts, and to the taxpayer. Um, there are two particular factors that affected the settlement process. One was the early involvement of defendant lawyers, lawyers in public authorities, who were telling their officials, non-legal officials, that this case ought to be settled. They were coming to look at the case afresh and advising settlement. The second point, very important, was the ability of the lawyers for the public authority to communicate with lawyers for claimants. That relationship was a very important relationship we found. Trust, knowledge, experience of the system is very important. And this is a, has, a, has a, an implication, of course, in the context of the uh, recent cutbacks on legal aid. Um, there is going to be an increase, there's already been an increase, there's going to be an increased use of litigation by self-representing <coughs> claimants. Um, and if what we found applies generally, it is likely to be the case that self-representing claimants are going to find it much more difficult to negotiate, negotiate the settlement process. And it may well be that the rate of settlement in favour of claimants declines. And it may well be that there will be adverse consequences in terms of costs and time um, and bother for public authorities as a result of that process. So I think this is something that, 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 that hasn't been given um, adequate uh, attention. Let me move on in the, in the remaining uh, few minutes to the final study, that on the effects of judicial review. This study picked up where the dynamics study uh, ended it looks, uh, looked at the effects of judgments, and in particular, the effects of judgments on, on claimants. The paper sets out uh, uh, an explanation of our methods and some of the uh, other findings, but I want to focus on one aspect uh, here, and that is the question, do claimants benefit when bodies reconsider their decisions following the judgment? This is a, a key question for uh, judicial review lawyers. You know, what happens? when a public authority reconsiders its decision following a judgment. The hypothesis, widely held hypothesis, is that judicial review is an expensive and time-consuming detail <coughs> to an outcome. The, wide, the, the widely held hypothesis is that um, following a successful judicial review, public authorities essentially make the same decision as they were going to make, but this time complying with the process requirements dictated by the courts. And as Crick and Macmillan put it in, in their research in Australia, a successful judicial review would most likely be followed by an agency remaking the same decision through taking care to avoid the earlier legal area, error. Now that's, uh, that's been the prevailing hypothesis. So um, um, it's a, an issue of, of, 
considerable practical importance and very important in the context of the government's reforms on judicial review uh, at the moment. Because if it's, if it's true, then it, it may well be that judicial review isn't worth the fuss, the fuss and the bother and the expense. And maybe the, the, the government is justified in, in curtailing the, the process. Now, the research in the United States and Australia, as, uh, as many of you will know, uh, that has looked at this has found um, that um, uh, judicial review has a substantive impact, as it were, on the uh, outcomes of, of cases. Shook and Elliott, uh, some years ago, found, for example, that remand of decisions back to US agencies resulted in what they called major changes in the petitioner's favour in 40% of cases. Craig and, and Macmillan, who I've just referred to, found that in, in, in the context of the Australian Federal Court, in about 60% of cases where decisions were set aside, the applicant ultimately obtained a favourable outcome. And uh, they concluded um, that the belief that after being successfully challenged, administrative bodies will routinely seek to remake their original decision has been disproved and said... If theories are built upon facts, then the value of judicial review when producing a favourable outcome to an applicant has been demonstrated. So they were quite bullish about the effects of their, their findings in the context of Australia. Because we all know, Peter Cain's reminded us, we cannot automatically apply findings from one jurisdiction to, uh, to another. But this research project was an opportunity to look at this issue in the context of, um, of the United, uh, or, or United Kingdom. We looked at 198 cases, and in 198 cases, we found that the judicial outcome favoured claimants in 100 of those cases. In 43 of those cases, the decision appears to have been quashed, and there were known outcomes in 34 of those cases. Strange how the figure 34 repeats itself. That's, a, that's not a typo, that's true. There must be some sort of secret associated with 34. In only four of those cases was the ultimate outcome unfavourable to the claimant. So in 30 of the 34 cases where we had known outcomes, as to say the end of the day, the public body made a fresh decision that favoured the claimant. And the paper sets out the particular, particular examples of those outcomes. And the, the main observations, I think, are, are as follows. First of all, in those cases, judicial review enabled claimants to achieve a tangible, substantive redress. They got a substantial benefit. It wouldn't have been achieved but for judicial review. Judicial review affected the substantive outcome. Its influence extended beyond process. Its influence wasn't purely symbolic. The evidence suggests that public authorities genuinely engaged with the judicial review decision. This wasn't just uh, going through the motions. They didn't respond in ways that were wholly negative or purely ritualistic. And I think the findings fundamentally reinforce the importance of access to a, an inherent jurisdiction, a long-stop jurisdiction. The findings suggest, moreover, that uh, the research of undertaken in Australia may apply in England and Wales, and possibly more so. And they re reinforce further research, earlier research, that reminds us that we cannot take a monochromic image of judicial review as an institution that threatens public administration, is abused by claimants, um, and which fails to provide a route to substantive redress. In short, clamping down on judicial review will matter, both for claimants and possibly for public authorities. Thank you. Okay, well, I suggest we go straight to the questions. And um, we have a couple of mics posing, so we could start off, I think, with, with Mark. If people could please say who they are. Um, Mark Elliott, University of Cambridge. I'm not sure if this is a, an observation or a question. It's inspired by um, Rick and Carol's um, paper. Um, and I, I liked the distinction that you drew between uh, strike back and, and clamp down. 
Um, and just one thought which that prompted is how we should view those two phenomena and the extent to which we ought to distinguish between them. Um, I mean, it seems to me that clampdown in the sense of trying to exclude or make it more difficult to seek judicial scrutiny um, is highly constitutionally suspect and, and, and arguably, depending on the system, constitutionally unacceptable. On the other hand, you might say that strike back um, is a less suspect practice in the sense that it can be seen as part of a kind of to and fro um, dialogue, if you want to use that word, uh, between the court and the um, administration. So that, that was my, my first question. And then the second thought it prompted is, how robust is the distinction between strike back and clamp down? Because I guess the risk is um, that if, if we have wide-scale use of strike back, then it sort of collapses into a de facto kind of, of, of clamp down. Um, well, I'll, uh, I'll, take, I'll take the second one, if you like, um, because it's been the subject of some argument between Cowell and Rick about <laughs> the, the robustness of this distinction. And we, we, we started off with the idea just of striking back, right? Um, but then perhaps influenced, as I, as I was indicating, perhaps influenced by the theme of the, um, uh, of the conference, we thought that it, it was useful Right, to, 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 to focus down a bit more on planting down. And um, I, I, I actually agree with both, both, both points you're making. Right? Um, I certainly wouldn't want to suggest that there's a bright line distinction between the two, but I do think it is useful to um, be talking and, and to introduce both concepts because of the, the, the other point you made, Mark, which is that when you are talking about clamping down, the constitutional stakes immediately look much higher, right? And it does then raise this very interesting question um, in, in our system of parliamentary government that we clearly are in a situation where the government is wearing two hats. On the one hand, it will be the arch repeat player litigant, and on the other hand, it, well, it may have effective control of the parliamentary process. Though what I was trying to indicate was that I think that this is a very interesting area where uh, the government has actually struggled to control the parliamentary process. Um, they didn't manage it back in 2004 and already they've come under immense pressure in relation to their proposals on clamping down this time round and you know both publicly um, sort of outside Parliament and inside Parliament. And I think it would be very interesting to see how far they actually get with this. I haven't much to add because we are more or less agreed uh, on it. <clears throat> but I do think, firstly, the distinction, like most distinctions, is in no way robust and merely a distinction of convenience. Um, the two things blend into each other. But um, secondly, I think both things can, on occasion, be highly suspect. And I read some of the um, Court of Human Rights cases on games played in other states in getting rid of um, litigation against the state, which seemed almost vengeful. And uh, on the other hand, uh, it, retrospective legislation can be, as Tony Prosser so many years ago, said quite justifiable, it's in the public interest maybe to save uh, the taxpayer enormous sums of, of money. But we do think that there should be big principles and that they should be good governance principles, transparency, debate, and um, possibly not too much fast track legislation. Okay, thank you. Yes, we have a question here. Hi, Liz Fish. On? Yeah, Liz Fisher from Oxford. I, first of all, a, a kind of question comment for Morris and then one that moves over and talking about striking back and clamping down. And my question is, what is it that officials think they're responding to when they're responding to judicial review? Because it, actually it seems to me quite am ambiguous. And let me use two very unscholarly anecdotes. One was a, a local planning officer who said, the law is interpreted this way because of a judgment. And I asked them to send me the judgment. And what I got 
was an anonymous case note of a planning inspector decision that they were treating as law. Second, I, in, a, in, in the US, talking to a US scholar and we were tearing our hair out at a case and we were talking to an official in the relevant administrative agency and he said quite naturally, I would never read this judgment without having the Federal Register next to me. So, so what, you know, when we're talking about judicial review, that seems to me quite ambiguous and I was wondering if you could comment on that. And that brings me back to striking down and clamp, uh, striking back and clamping down. Isn't there also a question of, of opening up administration and saying that there may be different parts of the administration engaging and striking back? And again, I can think, think of examples where people were quite <coughs> pleased that judicial review actions were brought against their own administrative body. Right. Well, um, what, 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 are, what do officials think they're responding to when they're responding to judicial review? Well, I suppose there's, there's a number of different answers to that. Um, in a particular case, in a particular instance, very often um, the, it depends on which officials you're speaking to. Um, for, for the most part, um, officials are responding to an interpretation of the case that they are provided with, perhaps by their, their lawyer, if they're close to their lawyers, or by their senior management, or by other aspects within the system. So there's a, there's a kind of um, process of interpretation that is going on within the system. And it is quite plausible I, to, 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 to find within a large and complex public authority um, different interpretations of the same case being considered and debated and indeed being argued for and uh, cases can quite often be seen very differently within public authorities. So there isn't a single, uh, single uh, concept of judicial review or understanding of judicial review in that context. Uh, but the other issue is, well, are you talking about judicial review or are you talking about some other broader phenomena? You know, that, are you talking about a particular case or are you talking about the law? or the courts, and um, quite often, uh, I guess, when I've spoken to, to, to local public, public administrators, there are different conceptions. I mean, uh, at one level, I remember doing some research where we were talking about judicial review, and they had no, the officials we, we, we were talking to had no idea of judicial review. They, 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 claimed, they claimed to have known nothing about judicial review. Um, you know, if you said, what is judicial review, I don't know. But they understood concepts like reasons and fairness and procedures, they understood that. They didn't necessarily associate it with judicial review. They associated with the sort of management system and their, 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 their culture and the expectations within their authority. So the importance of inculcating within a management structure within a public authority is very important. The values of judicial review aren't necessarily those that are directly associated with what the courts are doing. Um, and you know, there are obviously variations on, on, on the themes. So my answer to that is, well, there's no single answer to that. Are you answering or am I answering? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, I think I haven't much to add except that we actually found cases where um, there was deliberate misinterpretation promulgated amongst the staff to make sure that um, a, a judicial review wasn't implemented uh, and the home office sets of home office cases uh, illustrate that very well and so does um, earlier research on um, welfare um, cases. We don't do empirical research in the sense that Morris does so we're always stuck with the um, written sources, but we would say that departments obviously differ in the way that they're structured and the people who take the decisions and um, um, maybe whether they have legal services. So I think that's a very wide question that on which a great deal of empirical research would be needed of the sort that pay, perhaps Ed Page has done in respect of government departments. In relation to clamping down, it, it, I think it's quite interesting, isn't it, to compare um, David Blunkett's efforts in 2004 with what Chris Grayling is doing now, because um, clearly, as, as Home Secretary, that was very much centred on asylum and immigration, which brings back echoes of what we were talking about in relation to Australia yesterday. 
Um, though, of course, pause to observe that asylum and immigration has for many years actually been the chief yes. subject matter of judicial review, so um, a, a, a huge chunk of it. But essentially it was geared, it was a home office driven initiative. The current one, of course, is very interesting because this one goes across the board, right? Yes, it has particular variations in areas like planning, but essentially this is about reordering, attempting to reorder the judicial review process generally in terms of intervention, in terms of costs, and um, in terms of the particular provision which is still running about um, that uh, permission to bring a case or a remedy uh, may be refused or a remedy may be refused if it is, and I've got it in front of me, highly likely that the outcome for the applicant would not have been substantially different. Now, of course, that bears directly on what do we mean by substantial difference. Now, as Morris is indicating, from the litigant's point of view, there may have been a substantial difference in those cases. From the administrator's point of view, it may have been all fairly marginal and whatever. But the interest of, of the current one, I think, is that this is not departmentally driven in the sense of being geared to particular areas of administration. This is a generalized attempt to revamp, reorder the, the rules of the judicial review litigation game. Okay, thank you. We've got a question here. Was it yeah. uh, Hi, I'm Davina Cooper. Um, this question for Carol and Richard. Um, have you looked at all at the legal consciousness literature as a way of thinking about um, elite political players' response to judicial review? I mean, it's been used a bit by um, people like Dave Cowan in terms of thinking at the local government level, um, but it seems it might be quite a useful literature for thinking about the very different and complex ways in which law is understood, but no, not only understood, but also engaged with and practiced by officials and politicians. Um, and I also wanted to ask Morris whether you found a difference in terms of the effectiveness of judicial review in relation to very ideological kinds of cases and, and more mundane kind of everyday ones. Because you can imagine more ideological cases could go both ways, that local authorities dig in, or alternatively that they, um, they want to show that they're responding because they're high profile cases. Um, so I wondered if you had looked at whether there was a distinction. Okay, in relation to the, far, the first part, uh, the answer is no uh, for the purposes of this paper. Um, that's not what we were into. We did, um, we did however, look at this um, in, at a much earlier point um, when we were doing pressure through law and we were thinking about ripple effects and how you evaluate the success of uh, pressure group uh, litigation. And um, there was some very interesting literature at that time um, in America uh, that we were able to, to, to think about and reflect upon. But that's not what we're, what we're trying to do in, in this paper. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think it's a very good question about the uh, high profile, high, highly ideological, as you put it, cases and what effect they have as compared to the more sort of routine or mundane cases, as it were. Um, and the beer case that I mentioned involving Hillingdon um, was in some ways a, 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 a politically sensitive case. So I wouldn't necessarily call it a highly ideological case, but it was a case that was brought by uh, asylum-seeking children in that particular instance. And asylum seekers, as, as we all know, do attract a particular political weight. And um, one of the reasons why that particular decision was important to Hillingdon and other local authorities um, in, in London, particularly around the, the Heathrow area, uh, was that um, it directly affected political decisions or policy decisions that have been made within the council about how much resource to invest in providing services to asylum seekers. So in one sense, it was a, a highly politically charged decision. And this was one reason why that particular judgment attracted so much attention, um, by, uh, not only by that authority, but by uh, other authorities. 
Um, and in the, in the paper we talk about the, the shock effect of judicial review. The shock effect of judicial review is, is not simply in terms of uh, sort of instrumental, direct instrumental consequences for the authority, uh, but it's also in terms of the political priorities of, that, of the authority um, and the need to come, somehow reconcile what the court is saying has to be done with their pat particular political objectives. Um, and it is a, a, a local authorities will find that a, have found that a, a very real challenge. Mm. Um, Rebecca Williams, Oxford. Um, I had a question for Professor Sunkin. I was very interested in what you said about the specificity of Justice Mumby's sort of instructions, if you like. And I wondered if that has implications for how we should go about doing administrative law and I wonder is there a link between some of the negative or non-existent impact of JR and the fact that as administrative lawyers we're sort of taught to be very fluid and context sensitive and, and not draw hard and fast rules and not draw hard and fast distinctions or lay down concrete tests or any of this kind of thing and should we maybe be a little bit less scared of doing that and, and a little bit more proactive in, in generating more specific rules that might then be able to be better guidance for, for administrators. Of course, that's a, a you know very interesting questions. We often we often told that these standards that the courts apply, reasonableness and fairness, are not very helpful for public administrators. I mean, they 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 they, they, they hide much more than they reveal, and they, they they beg all sorts of questions. And local officials will say, well, you know, what do we mean by fairness? And here we have it, 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 in the Caffini case. Uh, a very different approach by the judge. I mean, because Munby was coming to <coughs> judicial review not as a public lawyer in the traditional sense, he was coming as a family court judge. And he knew the area very well, and he took a very instrumental approach to his judgment, and he gave very precise, very precise guidance as to how care plans should be conducted and undertaken. And the local authority saw those instructions as extremely helpful, not necessarily welcome, but they knew where they stood. Um, so in that sense, but you know, it's a big question. Do we want our judges to be instructed, public authorities, as to how to do their work? And that uh, tension uh, between the, the court and uh, the uh, professional uh, expertise is a, is a key, key tension within, within the law. Um, so. Can I add something to yes. that? There's an alternative uh, view uh, in a case which I think is the Hurst Septon case in which the first instance judge, Mr Justice Bean, went into enormous detail about what ought to be done and how NICE ought to carry out its drug um, investigations and was jumped on with um, six feet in the Court of Appeal. So I think I'd be quite interested to know what view Australian judges would take of that kind of... Uh, guideline technique. If we could just have one more quick question, please. <coughs> Thank you, Paul Diamond, humble barrister. So I'm, I'm probably, that's not a contradiction in terms. I'm just trying to sort of, you know, perhaps uh, introduce uh, just a bit of pra practicality. I, I, on a bit addressed to Carol, on the sort of dual playing by the government. I, I was involved in the case of Strasbourg on the weighing of crosses. It got a lot of national publicity. We had a scene where the Prime Minister said he was going to introduce legislation to defend the cross. You may remember all of this. Meanwhile, they argued exactly the opposite um, in Strasbourg. And the executive, not Parliament, has a great vested interest, as you know, in... Um, the United Kingdom is a major player in the, in the Council of Europe. It's a major player in the, in the Council of Ministers in the EU. It has tremendous influence, and they like that influence. And, um, and I, I can tell you these courts are highly politicized in Strasbourg. Um, the conversations I had in Strasbourg, I can't repeat here, but you, know, you have decisions like the Lao Tse decision where a chamber of the European court banned the cross from Italian uh, all public Italian buildings. The Prime Minister of Italy simply says, no way. The, the, the Grand Chamber reverses. And there's this fluidness going on. With, with, and I can say the British government is a big player over there. It was very difficult. Well, in a way, all I can say in answer to that is yes. 
but I'll just amplify it by saying we were well aware of it, but we had 10 minutes to present, um, an ar I'd had to, uh, to present a very, very complicated argument. And I'm perfectly sure that happens not only in the Council of Europe, and you get threats like um, the, the UK being president for the time being, and saying we're going to reform the court, and you know, it's, I think Rick has called it a game of ping pong. We we're aware of that, but it wasn't what we wanted to write about. I'd like to uh, ask, us, ask you all to say thank you to our speakers.